Welcome to another episode of Up To. Nine years ago, Up To started as a live event series showcasing leaders who are as humble as they are successful. The humility piece is extremely important as we identify leaders who can inspire others. We try to focus our interviews on the non-business aspects of their lives. And in doing so, we have found there's a real thirst to explore their hearts and minds in atypical ways. Our host, as always, is Adam Kaufman. And on this episode, we are joined by Jody McLean. During the first season of the Up2 podcast, I had several companies and entrepreneurs approach me about potential partnerships, but I'm really selective before choosing to do something like that. One choice we did make happily is to partner with Vivid Front, a full service digital marketing and website design agency based in Cleveland that works with both local and national brands. They've built their entire client base on referrals and they've won a lot of awards, including the 2019 Inc. Magazine Top 5,000 Fastest Growing Companies, North Coast's Top Places to Work, and several others. They're known for their talent, they're known for their creativity, they're known for their culture, a firm I liked before we agreed to partner together for the show. Check out vividfront.com or you can email me and I'll introduce you to their dynamic leader, Andrew Spott. Our guest today is the CEO of Edens, a national real estate developer based in Washington, D.C. She has been with Edens for more than 30 years, and through her various roles on her ascension to the helm, she's been responsible for more than $15 billion in development and other real estate transactions. She's on the boards of two public companies, which could be a full-time job in and of itself, both Cushman & Wakefield and Extended Stay America. She's a trustee of the Urban Land Institute, She's on the executive board of the International Council of Shopping Centers, and she is impressively the deputy chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Virginia. She's on a college board, as well as the board of a residential incubator for entrepreneurs. All of this while being a very engaged mom and wife. What a feat. Wow. Jody, welcome to Up To. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Adam. What have you been up to? That, that's a great question. I like that. Uh, what have I been up to? I have been up to some really great work. Um, Edens has 2,600 retail partners uh, across the country in nine major markets. And what we've really been up to is um, opening new retailers, which is fantastic. Um, favorite part of my job is to get to witness new businesses opening, so coming after Last year, Mm. it is so refreshing to be back in the business of helping people open um, instead of helping people stabilize. Um, So so being back, um, it's great. I wouldn't say we're all the way there, but the future is so bright um, and feels so refreshing. I can sense Um, that. You're really excited. Yeah, I really am. So I, I would say first and foremost, that's what we've been up to. And I think you're planning on going to Europe pretty soon, so that's exciting to get out a little bit and start traveling again. We are. My um, husband's family is is um, mostly in Europe, in France. Um, we just returned from being in Martinique uh, with his family, which oh, wow. is French. And um, it was just really, this is the first time I've sort of been that far from home, um, which, was, which was just... Um, energizing is what I would say. It was really energizing. Um, Flying felt really safe. Good. I really respected how the airlines, we were on Delta, how how they handled Mm -hmm. the situation, but it felt safe and it it just feels good um, to be back out again. And you live in DC, in Washington DC proper. What is it like in your immediate environment? Are people out and about more? Are the restaurants a little more crowded? What's a a snapshot of your immediate area yeah you know we split our time between dc and charleston south carolina so we have seen a really stark difference um over this last year in dc um i would say that people are a little bit more um tentative right now um we're still under um some pretty strict Um, restrictions, protocols protocols and restrictions. Um, People are really respectful of one another. Um, But we also, we are right in the city, but we live um, overlooking a city park. 
And uh, the beautiful thing is we're still work from home. Essential mm. workers mm-hmm. are our only ones back in the offices um, in D.C. So I'm working from home. And my office fronts this little park, and all day long you can just hear people and the energy that's coming um, to us from commun- people just being desperate for that socialization. Plus it's springtime, which is always pretty it's in Washington. It's springtime, but even it, through the winter, the socialization that was happening, because it's not happening at the office, and, mm. and we are social creatures. So I would say um, you're seeing real tightness in communities. We, we've gotten to know our neighbors like never before. Silver lining. A, a silver lining, a startling fact, a little fact I'll give you. 31% of all Americans knew their neighbors going into COVID. That low. That low. Hmm. And so I, I can't wait to figure out what it is coming out of it. Um, but, but you know, I will say I'd like to think I knew my neighbors, but we have really cool people around us. Um, the restaurants, um, the city has been great about expanding outdoor space for our restaurants. I ate at Rasika last night, oh, and they had as Outdoors. many outdoor tables as indoor. I was really impressed. Now, you yeah. mentioned, Jody, that you still work from home at your company. Yeah. Have you guys thought about when you're going to, if at all, mandate a return? Or have you played out how that's going to yeah. be in stages? Yes. When we, um, when we went work from home, March 17th of 2020, 2020 Mm -hmm. we said you know we'll do this for two weeks and we started doling it out and finally we said this is crazy we've got to let people plan and so when we came back in january Mm -hmm. um what became obvious to us was you know what um we we set july 1st as our return to work because of schools because of family care because people what a lot of people also don't talk about is we all talk about um, responsibility of children. We we found out that a lot of people at our office also had a responsibility for parental care, primary parental care, mm-hmm. and whether they were living at the house or not. And so just to give everybody time to think this through, we set a date of July 1st. And how many people work in the D.C. office that will be coming back? Is it a large number? I know you have operations all over the place. It's a great um, question. Thank you. Um, It really is a great question. This is what I think we'll see. And I think it will be pretty consistent everywhere. I think 60% of our population, whether in D.C. or in Boston or Miami, I think 60% will come back pretty much full time, five days a week. I think that we'll have 30% that will come back let's just call it three days a week. Some weeks it might be four, some weeks two, but probably work on three days a week. flexibility early on. And then I think we'll have five to 10% that will come in, either work from home or come in a couple of times a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and really every sort of circumstance is a little bit different is what we've learned. Um, but that's, that's generally what we're expecting. This program is about leaders who are as humble as they are successful. And when you and I first spent any level of time together, we were at a conference together over in Europe. We had some time to have extended conversations. And I was so impressed with how you explained what your business is. There's a lot of commercial development companies out there, but you have a different way of looking about your business. And can you talk a little bit about how the culture, everyone says the culture matters, but you really changed your strategic mission of your company a few years ago. Can you can you talk about why Eden's is different? And it's clearly one of the reasons it's grown so much over the years. Sure. Um, I don't know if this is why it's different, but I, I will say this is what I think um, where our passion is driven from, and maybe just that passion in and of itself sets us apart. Um, but we are a purpose mission company. Um, we have about six and a half billion dollars of real estate, primarily retail. Six and a half billion. Wow, that's, and, that's a lot. In nine major markets. Um, but what happened? And our single purpose is to enrich community through what we believe is in this human analog format, which means that our purpose is to enrich community by bringing people together in a really routine format, three and a half 
trips per week, five hours of dwell time. Because when people come together that routinely to the same place. Excuse me, what does that mean, three and a half trips per week? That's the average what that's a consumer the average, does? That's the average times you would come to our place if you okay. lived. And so these are uh, shopping communities, yeah. retail it, communities. I'm trying to paint a picture okay. for folks who aren't, um, you know, lifestyle malls, some people might call. So we call our, our places community-oriented. Okay. A lot of them. We have 115. 115. Um, all you're are saying open all this air. so fast. This is a massive <laughs> business that you're in charge of. All, yes. All are open <laughs> air. Um, so we don't have any enclosed malls. Oh, right. um, a good bit um, are what we call mixed-use. So we're mostly urban or first-ring suburban. In Boston, we are only suburban New York not Manhattan, Washington, D.C., Charlotte, Atlanta, Miami, Houston, Dallas, and Denver. Basically the coolest cities in America we just named were lots of young people, oh, multicultural, yeah. diverse communities. And, and you know, I, I, let me just, so I'll finish. Um, so three and a half trips per week, five hours dwell time. When you come together like that, this is what happens. You start to feel part of something much larger than yourself. You start to feel like you're a part of community. And what we found is when people feel that way, prosperity happens. So prosperity happens economically, it happens socially, it happens culturally, and it happens soulfully. So we have soulfully, four like that. KPIs that we measure. Um, this is how we measure our success. Um, first and foremost is our employee engagement. Um, so our employees, and we use Gallup surveying, our employees report in 93 to 94 percent engaged with our purpose and mission of, um, of enriching community. A little bit lower in the 80s, high 80s when it comes to their specific jobs, but 93 to 94 percent. That then shows up. They're so passionate. It doesn't matter if you're... Um, in accounts payable or if you're a leasing agent or if you're head of development, um, we're pretty much the same passion that shows up at our properties. Hmm. And because it shows up and the way our properties are designed and they're curated and the, the care that's just reflected, you can walk into somebody's home and know that, oh my gosh, this person who's so passionate, the it's the same yeah. feeling. People want to spend more time. Mm -hmm. And when people want to spend more time at your places, for every 1% of additional time, we get 1.3% of additional spend. Mm. So therefore, our second KPI is our retail partner's productivity. Whether it's within our four walls or perhaps it's e-commerce that's driven because of that store. Um, and that typically will outperform 20 plus percent to their averages. Hmm. And because they can outperform, our third KPI is our total shareholder return. We're a private company. Um, we're, we're one of the largest in You're our space. You're a large private company. There we're a large private company. There are companies smaller than you, I'm sure you know, that so, are public. So making, yes, so making sure that our investor, obviously, um, I am a business person through and through. So our third KPI is our total shareholder return. And our fourth KPI is our community impact stats. So we measure, we have an index and we measure crime, we measure education, we hmm. measure health, and we measure opportunity um, with around all of our places. And then we also have a sustainability impact um, report that we produce every year. And now um, we've just launched our inaugural diversity and inclusion report that looks not only internally at the impact we're having, but the impact that we're having um, in our communities and in our industry. Those impact KPIs, is that unusual for your industry? I, I'm yeah, not an expert, sure. but that's I think a lot of, I think a lot of people report on sustainability. But for us, when we said, wait, it was 2006 when we started into this transition. We were founded in 1966. Um, I joined the company in 1990, but it was 2006 when we started to transition into this purpose-driven. And so when we did that, it was a story to tell, but what our people, so, so it's this loop, let me, it's a loop. Our people are 93 to 94% engaged in our purpose and mission. How do we, 
how do we measure that success at the community level? And we didn't know how to put together. We hired a consultant to help us put together the happiness index. And it turned out we really couldn't come up with that. No. But this seemed to be the right stats that said if people are engaged in a community, they're going to have more respect for others. They're also going to have more um, – They're when people are engaged in a community, they're happier. That That is a proved fact. They're happier. When people are more engaged in their jobs, they're happier. Well, what, how does that come out? Well, they probably take better care of themselves and health. Um, they probably uh, in employment. And so we- Makes we, common sense. We came to these four factors that we could access readily accessible data. Well, I've been to a data. couple of your properties and it seems, I'm, I'm not aware of the KPIs, but it seems like it's working. You know, pre-COVID, very vibrant. And I'm, I'm not a scholar or anything, but the Medici effect. Have you ever heard of that book, The Medici Effect? Yes. I, br I brought it in today because I feel like your properties <laughs> live these intersections that the author talks about. People from different walks of life, different economic categories, different ages. It's as if you either followed this book's plan or the book is, should be written about Eden's properties. Well, that, thank you. That's a compliment. Oh, it's, it's, it a, really. That's a wonderful. Yeah, compliment. I mean, I read these pages and I, I think about your business. Now, we have a lot of listeners who reach out to me and they tell me they're in the beginning of their careers. A lot of young people listen to podcasts. Did you ever think, Jody, when you started 30 years ago, that you'd be running this behemoth of a business someday, or did you think you'd come in for a couple of years and then do something else, or was that a long-term plan? Um, when I started um, 30 years ago, when I was two. Yes, um, exactly. When I started, no, I, I didn't start out to be CEO of Eden's, no. Um, when I was um, 13, I had my heart absolutely broken in half because I had um, declared, probably when I was six, and I was on this path to be the first female uh, justice on the Supreme Court. So when Sandra Day O'Connor was named in, uh, I think it was September of 1981, I was I was really heartbroken. And my mom was like- You were six or 13 then? I was 13. <laughs> That's a big and, goal. Oh yeah, I was 13. I think I had declared it though when I was <laughs> yes. six and I just stayed to it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, my life is over. What like I didn't want to be number two or three. <laughs> I wanted to be number one. <laughs> so then um, what I really wanted to do was be a sports agent. And I interned a couple of summers in college um, for a group in Chicago where I grew up, but a group in Chicago, um, sports agents. And I had this feeling it was a really male dominated, male chauvinistic um, industry. And maybe that's not what I wanted. Um, but I loved, I loved so much of the negotiations. I loved the work they were doing, the financial side. I loved all the work they were doing. Um, so they said, uh, when I graduated college, I thought I would either go back to law school or I would go get my MBA, but I wanted to work for a little bit. I really wanted to understand business. I wanted to understand how business was, was created. Mm -hmm. Um, so I took a job as an analyst at Eden's. Um, I had no intentions of, at that point in time, it was about a $100 million portfolio, primarily in South Carolina. I had no intentions of staying in South Carolina. And I was really open with mm -hmm. our founder, who mm -hmm. was my mentor, that I would stay for about two years. Um, but I really, I also went in with this attitude of, uh, I'm going to be a sponge. I'm going to give everything I have to give, mm -hmm. whatever that may be, and I want to take all that I can possibly take. And I would start, um, I grew up on what my grandfather used to call a toy farm right outside of Chicago. A toy farm. A toy farm. Okay. But I would have to collect the eggs in the morning. So before I would go to school, I'd have to get up early and collect the eggs, and my sisters would have to lunge the horses, and oh, we I all had these about chores. You. Okay. I had the grand champion egg layer at the Kane County Fair. Well, this like, should have been the primary topic of the uh, program today. My first, my first entrepreneurial venture, uh, venture was Jody's Eggs. Really? Yeah, awesome. Was, now that, I do have the t-shirt. So many skills. That's not so on your many. LinkedIn profile. I know, I should add it. But <laughs> uh, um, but so I would meet Joe, literally at 5.30, 5.15, 5.30. He was, was the founder of He Eden's. was the founder at the coffee pot. And he would be like, 
what are you doing here? So that wasn't a planned meeting. You would just kind of um Oh, no. I, it was, on my part, very conscious. On his part, he would always be like, what are you doing? What yeah. are you working Fancy on? Fancy meeting you here. That has you here. And I would say whatever I was working on. And he, he would he was very, we would engage in conversation. And that really led to this great mentoring relationship mm-hmm. where I learned so much about the business. It also gave me an opportunity um, to have somebody who sort of, at the highest level, really looking out. So I, I worked throughout every function in the company. I really wanted to learn as much as I could, mm-hmm. um, both from him about how deals were done, how how, what, how the business was valued, how how um, how value was created, and then I wanted to learn very tactically about the company. So it sounds like gradually you got more into it the more you learned. And it went obviously beyond your two years. It's interesting, this background, though, because I often ask entrepreneurs, did you always think you were an entrepreneur? You joked about the egg business, Mm -hmm. but you did some other non-entrepreneurial things, considering being an agent, Supreme Court justice. You know, there's not the same type of risk as an entrepreneur has to face. So do you think you were born a leader and it just took a while for you to know that you're going to be a leader, or is this something that you learned how to be a better leader? Are people born leaders, or can leadership be learned? Yes, and yes okay. is what would be my answer. You think you were you were a born um, leader? Because I feel like I, these are character traits that people either have or they don't have. No, I, I think I think I am a. I think I was a born leader, Mm -hmm. and I will say that, and being in leadership positions has always been very comfortable to me. Yeah, because it isn't for a lot Um, of people. You're being being humble, and that's awesome, but a lot of people would hear that bio that I read about you and think, how on earth could she do all those things? And, well, and I played a lot of competitive sports growing up. What'd you play? Oh, you name it. So I played um, tennis most competitively. I played field hockey very competitively. I played squash. Mm. I swam. Nice. Um, Uber athlete here. And, and and but so my senior year, I was captain of all of my sports teams. Oh, so you were. You, it was obvious you were a leader. So then. so that felt really comfortable place to me to be. Mm-hmm. But I'm also the youngest um, of three girls, mm. and so I think. I think I am an all or nothing person. Like either I am in charge in. or you're in charge. And I'm it's one or the other and if you're in charge, I'm really comfortable letting you be fully in charge. And but but I'm also really comfortable being in charge and I will own that. Well, it's but good I to also know. think you have to I just say one thing because you said are you born or you develop it? I, I think I think you have to always be developing your leadership Absolutely. skills. Just like in the sports. I mean, the best right. athletes still practice every day. But back to your leadership that I think probably you were born with and you worked on improving it. I remember a few years ago, I was sitting with one of my mentors and I was kind of critiquing myself because everything I got involved in, I had to lead. And I was like, it's such a horrible, vain thing that I'm cursed by this leadership. And he corrected me. He said, it's a blessing. Hmm. A lot of people can't lead. So you just described a blessing. You've been blessed with this leadership skill, these traits that most people don't have. And I just think it's um, something that a lot of people probably look up to you for, probably even more than you realize. Do you ever think about like who's watching you? Uh, You're too young to think about legacy yet, but do you ever think about who you might be uh, inspiring? No. It's a good question. I... What do I think about? I don't necessarily. I th- I think about messaging. The truth is, I do think about messaging a lot, and we're coming out of a year where I would say the one thing that I learned this last year mm-hmm. was radical communication, and and when you have people, you have twenty six hundred retail partners mm. who seventy percent one year ago seventy percent of our retail partners. Um, were mandated closed by the government mm. and with no real sense of what happens tomorrow. And therefore, I had an organization of people who said, 
oh my god what you know for what about our business and ultimately everybody says what about me what what's going to happen and so this radical communication what i learned was it had to be authentic it had to be transparent and it had to be really safe and steady and inspiring during a time where and so and people so I needed know, that leadership back to the prior topic they yeah, needed your leadership there i wasn't thinking about who's watching as much as what is the message that i really want people to walk away with because you, i think sometimes authentic and not necessarily telling people what they want to hear but telling them what they need to hear mm -hmm. builds the most trust and confidence mm -hmm. in the moment and that applies to stakeholders both internally co-workers team members but also your customers the stores their employees their 100%. customers i mean the stakeholder you're influencing a very wide-ranging stakeholder community a absolutely investors <laughs> right i didn't um, even mention that so yeah. how do you that's going to stay it sounds like post pandemic you're going to stay with this radical communicating what does that look like uh, more newsletters more phone calls more travel or how how does I, that stay with you i i hope i will mm -hmm. i i have um well we'll remind you we'll come back we'll sit down I, in a year and we'll ask how i radical. think we all say oh yeah i'm gonna change and and i i really hope i will i have i have saved a lot of notes, a lot of emails from people who have said, you know, thank you mm. for your leadership thing, and, and here's why. And a lot of it is around communication to remind myself this is one of the most important tools because I thought I was a pretty good communicator beforehand. Right, things are going great before I, the pandemic. Yeah, I thought so. Um, but what, it, what does it look like? Internally for us, what it looks like um, is doing what we call coffee and conversation so we were doing this just about when we started we were almost doing it weekly by every two weeks at a minimum um, to get everybody together the best we could do mm -hmm. was on a zoom like call mm -hmm. um, but it is it is also um, email email works but it's not the same no it's not the same as, as making yourself vulnerable and saying you know what ask any question you want to ask and I will sit here and I will accept it um, no different than when we started to have the riots back in May our a lot of our places were front line mm. there um, and getting back to and sitting with people and saying we there what we did was um, instead of saying ask me any question you want in front of a broader group that that may not have been as comfortable for these really uncomfortable um, we gave everybody in our company and encouraged them to read with their families um, the letter from the birmingham jail mm. which unfortunately still resonates very loudly today from 1963. a group we're both involved in path north actually sent that letter out i think during covid and i hadn't read it since you know, high school probably yeah, powerful it is a powerful piece so i had sent it to everybody and then i we i didn't know exactly how this would work so it was a little for, what we call forced family fun was we broke every we, we set 90 minutes we closed the company for 90 minutes we gave everybody a small intimate group of about 10 with a facilitated leader this is virtual this had to be virtual, okay. um, but with a facilitate with a leader who could facilitate a conversation that started to be about this piece, mm -hmm. but led very quickly to really personal, intimate conversations. You just created an environment, just like you do with your places, where people could comfortably be themselves and hopefully exchange ideas. It's very similar to what you're doing with your yeah. day job, so to speak. And people don't see eye to eye, for, but that, that sure. fosters a lot of respect and it fosters confidence in their own voice. And so I think for me, radical communication will look, it will take various forms, sometimes mm -hmm. really intimate and sometimes um, in broader, but it's gotta be routine. I'm grateful that Calfee, Halter, and Griswold has once again agreed to partner with us. With offices in Ohio and Washington, D.C., this full-service national law firm focuses on all aspects of business and the law, including corporate and finance, intellectual property, and government relations. Let me be clear. I actually approach companies with whom I would like to partner. We just don't accept marketing dollars from anyone. 
I have been referring my CEO and entrepreneur friends to Calfee for years. I really believe in the firm. One of their notable practice areas is in mergers and acquisitions. And recently, for instance, I introduced a successful entrepreneur in the Midwest to Calfee when he told me that a European-based conglomerate wanted to buy his business. Calfee works with large corporations as well as privately held companies throughout the U.S. and Canada and in Europe and Asia too. So whether it's selling your own business or the more routine needs of creating your first will or anything in between, this firm can really do it all in terms of legal needs. Once again, the firm is Calfee, Halter, and Griswold, and you can find them at C-A-L-F-E-E dot com or on the Up to Foundation website. As the COVID protocols begin to uh, decrease all over the country and the world, uh, we're all eager. I mean, the airports are crowded right now. I've been in a few recently. We're all eager to get out and do things that we haven't been able to do, whether it's personally or professionally. I, I like asking folks like you who are so accomplished, like, how do you decide, Jody, what to get involved in? What I call elective time. You have so many opportunities to do so many different things. This is a brilliant question. Another brilliant question. Did you hear that, Mr. Producer? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Like, how, you do you, know, how do you think about yes to this, no to that? Hopefully it's more no's than yes's, but you're involved in a lot of things. I, I'm, I'm actually... You don't um, sleep, maybe. Between you and me, and I guess whoever else is listening to this. We've been downloading um, 70 countries. I, I, well, I'll just put it out there then. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going through right now what I call the sorting process. So Sorting, I like that word. So, so for a long time, um, I was what I was involved in was my career life and my family life, and there was not there was nothing in between. Mm -hmm. um, we we have four, um, Pierre and I have four children, um, and we, we really feel strongly about that family time. Um, for us, um, sitting around the dinner table was our sacred cow. Um, we tried to make it work five days a week, which mm. on my schedule was sort of crazy, but we did it. That's impressive. Um, and it was, wor it was worth it. So that meant there was no time for much else. And then um, we, we had parental care for my parents. Um, and so we, we've sort of, we've gone through that. Mm -hmm. Three of our kids are out of, out of college and they're um, independent Off mostly. Off the races, yeah. Yeah, they're mostly independent. They, they still come back by the house routinely, which we love. But, um, and so once I went through that, time in my life um i really started saying and we still have chase at home but i started saying yes to too many things mm -hmm. and not not what you read out but but just too many things um and now what i'm realizing so i'm, I'm going through what i call the sorting process to really make sure I'm really intentional about my time. Let's stick with the sorting. I like that word. Some busy CEOs have like personal mission statements. Some have tenants, whether it's about health or faith or family. Like when you sort, what are you using to sort? Just do I like this idea or is it a rumble in the belly that you either have or you don't have if someone is approaching you about something? How do you how do you sort? What 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 are the variables that put the sorting into this bucket or that bucket? I mean, it's, it comes down to two things. It is, can I make an impact okay. here? And can it make an impact? Can, can this make an impact on me? I like that. Um, so, so some of the things that I feel really, really passionate about, other people try to dissuade me. Um, I, I want to be involved with um, women entrepreneurs. Um, but so I feel like I can make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, what I have found is the impact back to me. Um, it, it, it fulfills it you. It is. It's really fulfilling. Um, once they have their confidence about them, I can't tell you what I've learned from so many of these young entrepreneurs back. Um, it reminds me what it's like to be an entrepreneur, what it's like to be a startup. If I have one goal for Edens, it is to, to, to bring back a startup mentality. Um, you know, yeah, so it's mutually so beneficial. fail fast. So right. there's some things like that. And there's some things where I feel like, um, and this, I think you have to move beyond, but there's, 
the Federal Reserve Board, I absolutely love. Hmm. And I, I could not, at first I thought, what do I, can I make an impact? But I think my purview and what I see from the consumer side and, and the intellect that I've been able to receive back has been remarkable. Learning. You know, mm-hmm. still learning, right. learning how to be a better leader as well, like learning. you said earlier. Right, and and networking, and and at the end of the day, networking. You mentioned the female entrepreneurs, and I'm basically with entrepreneurs all day, every day. And I heard about Halcyon through you and our other mutual friend Carol. Great. And I think you're still involved there. Right. And I I see incubators and accelerators all over the country, but there's something special about Halcyon. I've now been there. You might have arranged my first visit, and the residential component to it is really interesting. And when I asked you, do you ever think about who's watching you? I'm, I'm positive a lot of the housing on, on, entrepreneurs are, are watching you probably even more closely than you realize. I'm sure you inspire them. Well, that is it's a fabulous group. And, and I think because first and foremost, it's focused on social impact, mm-hmm. entrepreneurs. So it's entrepreneurs that are business oriented, that that you can be a capitalist and you can make a huge social right. impact at the same time. But it's more than just selling a widget it's of some kind. It's more than just selling a right. widget. Well, let's talk about these last two subjects. You said the female entrepreneurs and, and we were talking about leadership. I want to ask you an honest question. There's a lot of well-intentioned men who would put together a conference and maybe there's a panel on female CEOs or I've seen you on most powerful women lists, you know, well-intentioned editors. I've now learned though that some women hate that kind of separation and some are fine with it. Um, We were talking before the program about our mutual friend Charu. Mm -hmm. She can't stand it when she's being asked to be on a women in entrepreneurship panel. Help, Help us men figure out what's best for is there a separation or you just want to be considered an entrepreneur or a leader? Can you react a little bit to this? Con- sure. Confu- I don't even know how I'm asking it, but I think you get the gist of how confused I am about the No, I, I completely get it. And I, I feel like I have a pretty good perspective on this. Okay. Um, I have, we have two girls and two boys and, and I love them both. And I, all four of them, and I want all of them to have the exact same opportunities. Sure, um, is what I want, and I don't want um, my boys to not have opportunities because they're um, because they have been in a privileged. Yeah, they're not um, in a protected category. They're, they're, or well, something. they they have been privileged. I mean, they really yeah. have been. Um, but I don't want my girls. I want my girls to take advantage of their own leadership skills. Um, and I say to the boys all the time, I don't really believe in female leadership versus male leadership. I think the best leadership is gender balanced. At our company, our my executive management team is made up of four people. There are two women and there are two men. Mm. Um, I don't know that I was purposeful about that. I was going to ask that. It was, was that intentional? It was the best or? person for each job. Just and merit. It was pure merit, but but that balance is really felt. Mm-hmm. It's really felt because there's certain um, inherent traits that I do think Jamie, my chief investment officer, my, we bring to the table, and there's certain er- inherent traits that my my CFO and and our chief development officer bring to the table. And as a group of four, we are so we are incredibly powerful. That's what I would say. And when, there's different lenses. Everyone's and looking at life and business got, through different yeah. lenses. Back to the Medici effect, these different walks of life, as basic as male, female, you can have different solutions it, or different ideas. It's, it's so true. So one of us grew up on Long Island. One of us grew up in the Midwest, in Chicago, one in Miami, one in the South. Mm-hmm. All of the, We have very different backgrounds that we've come to this table front with. But that gender balance, that's what we're talking about, is gender balance. Mm-hmm. That's where I think the real power comes from. But I think until we get to this balanced place, I'm going to keep the mic and I'm going to be loud for women. And once we get there, I will drop the mic and it's I'm done. But um, I'm heavily involved uh, with something at the James Beard organization called Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Program. Okay. And, we, and James Beard, that's a... 
Restaurant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's restaurant and chef. It, it is the system. Academy Awards. Right, so let's right, just say the, right. the James Beard. But but they also have these impact programs. Okay. And so um, we we helped launch actually the Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Program. And I say every year because in that industry that um, is one of the most important industries. I knew this before COVID. I think the whole now world everyone knows, knows, it, right. knows it because it is the second largest employer and it moves more people every year by number from economic instability to economic stability. Mm -hmm. It is a pathway to economic stability in this country um, and we can't overlook that. But there are, so, there are so many policy changes that need to be made. But when everybody's sitting at the table, so only 6% of executive leadership in that industry um, is male. I mean, is female. female. Only six. I mean, and I it, knew it would be. And we're moving it. We're shaking the trees wow. really hard. But, but they're not talking about all the policies that need to be changed, not because the men are asses or they're trying to hold the women back it has nothing to do with that it's because this is the way it's always been and it's a pretty good way but when you get uh, this is what i found because a lot of times i'm the only woman when i sit at the a lot table, of times you're the only woman at the meeting you mean at, at the meeting isn't at that, the table telling? yeah and you're the and, boss you're the most important woman at the meet person and, uh, at the meeting and if i or if i'm at an industry event and i throw up an idea i can tell sometimes they're like that's crazy. Hmm. But what they're really saying is it never dawned on us. Of course. Different it lens. It never dawned on us. This is a different lens. But I've never had – I mean, so so a lot of times you'll have men say, I just never thought about it that way. How, right. I, like, like, let's embrace this idea. I just idea. admitted it. I never thought that maybe having a women in business panel at a conference was a bad idea. Right. I thought it was a good idea. So keep doing I, this. Keep the I microphone. Like we need your help. Yeah. You mentioned restaurants. Do you uh, personally get involved with picking which restaurants go into your properties, or do you have to let other people do that? Or it seems like you're kind of passionate about the food experience. Yeah. Oh, the food experience is everything. Yeah. Think about what happens around a table. I mean, I mean it's my community. favorite category. Community right. is built around the right. table. I'm Lebanese. And, I mean, the meal yeah, oh, experience. Yeah. And there's the, the food is a common language. Yes. You you could be speaking Chinese and I could be speaking Dutch, and if we shared a meal, we could express ourselves mm -hmm. beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, it's a common language. So, but do I personally? I I wish I could, but really, you don't. I have to. Have I, other people I, my doing team that. is so strong. Right. Um, I, I try not to ever second guess. They're really experts. You've mentioned some things casually in the few years I've known you. I feel like you're good at identifying trends. Like, is there something you're really excited about right now or something you could give us a preview of in terms of what's going to be going into these properties or what consumers are really looking for now? Like a few years ago, the trend was like shared workspace. Is there some yeah. new trend that we should begin to think about sure. that you're eyeing, eyeing? Sure. Coming out of COVID, um, going into COVID, and thank you for saying that. I actually really appreciate that because going into COVID, it, it took me a few months to realize we were actually fully prepared for COVID. Mm. We were not prepared for 70% of our retailers to be mandated closed, not even in the least bit. Who would but be, this though? acceleration of trends is what happened. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about all these trends and we were thinking about them all. And it was like we have been practicing for game day and we were in shape and we were prepared. I think coming out of COVID, what you will see, the big trends, you, you will see um, a couple of things. And, and if you want to know from merchandising, I would tell you health and wellness is the biggest trend period. It's mm. four and a half trillion dollar um, biz industry that's going to grow 6% through 2024, but health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Health is the new wealth, and it'll show up in all different formats. So we have a lot of um, health care that's being retailized, so where um, doctors or, or um, health care wants to be embedded in communities, so a lot of well check -ups. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. A lot of wellness, but also... Um, um, care for the whole person, so a lot of that. So but, would we see, excuse me, Jody, like right now there's uh -huh. like medical plazas right. off in the distance. Yes. But now there could be like Lululemon and a 
cosmetic place and then an even heavier and medical then, place. And then and that medical place may be, it's, it's not as much like the dock in the box as it is a place where you may go, um, yes, for some physical, but you might also go meditation for some men or mental wellness or, mm -hmm. or meditation. And so we're seeing a lot of that growing. How about barber shops? You're doing more with barber shops? Yeah, I, I'm always looking for good barber shops. Yeah, but you coming. But yeah, no, I mean, of course, um, salons are always yeah, yeah. in barber shops. No, I, I joke, but what are the trends? But this health is and great. wellness okay. is, is going to be the biggest trend. I think, mm. and and it's going to impact every part of of our experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, we are making sure all of our places feel green space is really important to people. How we're using greenery, um, how you feel there, your ability, um, mental wellness and emotional wellness, and being able to engage with people, and then just physical. So. Um, we we have Soul Cycle outdoors. We do a lot of outdoor yoga. Outdoor um, yoga. Yeah, hmm. a lot of it everywhere. So so that's that's the biggest trend. Um, but hyper localization is another big trend. So what does that mean? I see that in your literature. What does that mean? Hyper local. It means more seventeen than minutes. Table. Seventeen minutes from your home, and you're going to want to support, and you're going to want to, um, you're going to want personalization. So you're going to want to know the people there. People know you. You're going to want to know, who, um, even if you're at Publix, you're going to want to know the butcher, and the butcher know you by name. Huh. You're going to, you, you want this relationship where you really want to support local. So of course you want your food locally sourced, but right. you also um, want to feel um, this, that whoever's there is really embedded in your local community I, and you're going to go to bat for I them. I guess I'm seeing that more in my own life and my behavior. Of course. I didn't call it hyper-local, but maybe going to the local winery yeah. to get the wine rather than going to Costco. Yes. I like Costco too, but that's what you're right. talking about. And we're seeing that. That is going to be explosive coming out of COVID. And mm. and so it's more than just supporting the small business, though we've seen a lot of that. But it's really this attachment to the local. Um, and that, that will resonate. That will be here um, for for a long time. Mm. Um, BOPIS, which is something we call buy online, pick up in store. Buy online, pick up in store. We okay, call it cool BOPIS. acronym. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's going to be here because the cost of delivery, that last mile, is so expensive, um, either for the merchant, especially in grocery. Mm. Um, so that affects how you maybe build. It affects how we think about the logistics because I want huh. your, if your wife is running late to the baseball game and she needs to pay, or you are, and you need to pick up something quick, I want you to be in and out because that is a great experience for you in that moment. Yeah, it's convenient. But when you come back for date night and you're saying, where do you want to go out to eat? We want you to come back and we want that experience to feel great and you're not in this traffic pattern. Hmm. So how do we design for that and then the other thing um two other things i would just add to that is casualization so um apparel but in our places things have become much more casual in people's sure. attitudes and people's stress yeah and I don't, yeah and a little bit i would go athleisure yes but also think about men and casualization and i don't i don't know when the suit and tie yeah. is gonna i wonder about that too as, as a male uh, brooks brothers attire versus and then the other thing we Lulu think Lemon. about is work anywhere and work everywhere which is a little different than the co-working space so i talked about our people coming back to work those who don't come back those 30% that work in the office, let's just say three days a week, those other two days, they may decide I'm gonna go to the Eden spot where there's a great coffee house or, or how we're designing our nice places. Common area. Where, where we welcome you to come with your laptop mm -hmm. because you like the proximity of other people. Um, but we're thinking about how we design so you could also, if we needed to have a private phone call, how do we make all that? So we think that how people work is really going to impact design of our places as well. It's remarkable, Jody, how fast time goes. Like the year of COVID, it's like a blur. I often think it should be slow because of our lifestyle and the protocols, but it's gone so fast. 
this session today has gone fast. It's already time for us to wrap up. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. You know, you've been, speaking of time, 30 years at Eden's. If you could go back and tell the first year Jody at Eden's some advice, what would you tell your younger self back at the beginning of this long run? I would tell myself to scooch right up to that table. Um, it's okay. Um, I would tell myself to ask the question that I was um, embarrassed or uncomfortable to ask because I figured everybody else knew in the room. Hmm. Um, that was great I advice. I said yes to a lot of things, and I'd say... Uh, I. So what I would say to the younger me, because the younger me is, was a young woman, is say yes when you're 65% ready. You don't have to wait till you're 100% ready. That's great advice for all entrepreneurs at all ages. But mm -hmm. I asked that question to many of our guests. That might be the best answer we've, we've had so far. So thank you. And you didn't know I was going to ask it. So I had no you idea. hit it out of the park. Jody, thank you so much for being on thank the UpTo podcast. Having. And I'm respectful of your time, and I know how busy you are. So just really grateful you could join us today. Thank you for listening to the Up To Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe via your podcast platform of choice. To receive our newsletter, suggest speakers, and give your candid feedback, please email Adam directly at adam at uptofoundation.org. We would love to hear from you. The Up To Podcast is produced by the BL Media Group right outside of the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. See you next time.